Ani and Surya. Hello. Welcome. Thank you very much. Hey there. <laughs> Well, hello to uh, everyone. Welcome to our second uh, part on functional structural components of tropical ecosystems. Uh, my name is Juan Posada. I will be the moderator for this session. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of El Rosario in Colombia. And I'm also very involved with ATBC as the, the chair of the meeting for next year in Cartagena and co-chair of the Neotropical chapters and also co-organizer in this meeting. So, um, so it's my pleasure for me to introduce the, our speakers. We have a green line of, uh, of talks now. Uh, so I'm gonna quickly go over their, their name, affiliation and, uh, and the title of their talks. So first, uh, uh, we're gonna have a presentation by uh, Surya Maharj Maharjan. Uh, on functional traits shape tree species distribution in the Himalayas. Uh, he's from the Institute of Forestry in Tribuhavan University in uh, Nepal. Then we'll have a talk by uh, Carly Pomeroy uh, from UCLA, Los Angeles in California. Uh, the title is there, Latitudinal Gradient in Sapling Growth Strategies. Then we'll have a talk by Augusto Silvia from the Universidad Federal do Rio Grande do Norte on uh, ecological strategies in the Caatinga seasonal dry forest and woodlands. After that, Caroline uh, Dolstream from McGill University uh, uh, will present on multiple fine root trait syndrome may coexist effectively balancing nutrient acquisition costs in similar soil conditions. Then Sebastian Tello, uh, from the Missouri Botanical Garden in St. Louis, Missouri, will present mountain uplift, shapes, elevation, and phylogenetic, phylogenetic patterns of functional trait variation in trees. Then um, Sash, uh, Sash Skank uh, Ongole will present functional traits, predict tree uh, level phenological strategies in a Mesic Indian savanna. Uh, and he's from the University of Beirut uh, in uh, Beirut, Germany. Uh, then Leonardo uh, Marachipe Santos will present the response of functional traits of preserved and fragmented riparian forest in the Southern Amazon. And Leonardo is from the Institute de Pesquisa Ambiental da Amazonia. 
Then Mimi Serrano from uh, San Francisco State University will present tracking leaf trade differentiation of newly diverging subspecies of Kenopodium hawaiense um, on the Hawaiian island. Then Stephanie uh, Gagliardi will present root functional traits and microbial variation across a gradient of foliar disease incidence in agroforestry systems. Stephanie is from the University of Toronto in Canada. And then at, uh, at last, our 10th presentation will be by Juliana Strop uh, from the Museo Nacional de Ciencias Naturales uh, of Madrid, in Spain, linking taxonomy and macroecology, the impact of 300 years of taxonomic reclassification on observed species richness of the Amazonian flora. So welcome to all our panelists. A quick reminder before we start our presentation, um, the, Please use, as you probably hear, heard that several times today, but please use the question and answer uh, windows within Zoom. Do not use Wuba for, 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 for the attendees that want to ask questions. When you ask a question, please include the name of the panelist um, before your question. So it's easy to know to whom it is directed. And um, the, you can ask questions at any time. Uh, during the first, we're going to have a, the a around 50 minutes video of all the presentation. So you can ask questions then, or you can ask them at the end. The, the questions will be answered at the end of the session. For about, we have, we'll have about 10 minutes. Um, so I think that covers it all. So Patricia, please go ahead. Oh, and uh, before I start, uh, we will all turn off our microphones and camera, and I will ask the panelists to, to turn on their cameras uh, when when the, to, to answer questions. Thank you again. Hello. And namaste, I'm Surya Kumar Marzan from Nepal. On behalf of my research team, let me welcome you all in our lightning talk on star trade shape tree species distribution in Himalayas. During this talk, I'll be taking you through introduction, issues, question methods, and results in discussion. What shape species distribution pattern is one of the central questions in ecology? Understanding the mechanism that shape species distribution pattern is not only important for present day conservation, but also for predicting the species response to global warming and designing climate adaptation measures. Plant functional traits are any morphological, physiological, or phenological attributes that affect plant growth, survival, and reproduction. Therefore, they determine plant performance and have potential to shape and predict the species distribution. The Himalayas are amongst the global hotspot of biodiversity. They present one of the longest and steepest elevational gradients and are severely affected by global warming. Therefore, Himalayas are ideal system to test potential traits to shape and predict the species distribution. We specifically address three research questions. What plant strategy can be distinguished among Himalayan tree species? Globally, a fundamental axis of evolutionary specialization that extends from species with conservative strategies, such as small, thick leaf with top tissues, to species with executive strategy with opposite shoots of traits exist among the plant species. We tested if the same strategy spectrum is found among Himalayan tree species. What plant traits? How plant traits and strategies are associated with elevation. Environmental conditions get harsher with increase in elevation across the modern landscape. We tested whether harsher environmental conditions and higher elevation select for species with more conservative trait values, such as small size, small leaf, and tough tissues, and vice versa. What plant traits are the best predictor of species position along elevational gradient? We tested whether plant traits associated with conservative vegetative strategy spectrum are the best predictor of species position along elevational gradient. We focused on 31 most abundant tree species. To account for elevational variation, we sampled for each species. Each species, six healthy looking trees with sun exposed crown, trees from lower and upper elevational distribution limits. To reduce ontogenic variation, we sampled adult trees with 10 to 30 centimeter diameter and breast height. Trade trees were sampled mainly from natural forests in the areas with slope less than 45 degrees. Black dots in the map represent the location of sampled trees. For each sample tree, we quantified 39 traits at whole tree, branch, and leaf level. 
To evaluate what plant strategy can be distinguished among tree species, we carry out cluster analysis and PCA. We eva to evaluate how plant traits and strategies are associated with elevation, we carry out by correlation analysis. And to identify best predator tree, we regress species average elevation of position with species trait mean using all subsidy regression analysis. Cluster analysis identified five trait clusters associated with vertical expansion, horizontal expansion, metabolic efficiency, physical defense, conifer versus broadleaf. PCA so that at the right of the first axis are species with large stature, large thin leaf with high nutrient concentration, and vice versa. First strategy axis reflects variation in plant size, leaf economics, and leaf nutrient concentration represents safety versus safety. Efficiency spectrum at the top of the second axis are species with tissues with top high densities and vice versa. Second axis that reflects variation in tissue densities re represents tissue toughness spectrum. Both axes reflect part of conservative activity uh, paradigm and jointly explain nearly 50% of trade variation. First strategy axis was negatively associated with elevation, whereas second strategy axis was independent from elevation. Multivariate strategy axis, especially the first one, was more strongly related to elevation than the individual traits. Along the first strategy axis, that reflects a trade-off between multiple safeties and efficiency, tolerant species at left have competitive advantage in harsh highland, where productivity is low and are open and competition for life is less. Efficient species at right have competitive advantage in benign lowland, where productivity is high, standard dense, and competition for light is high. Second strategy axis that reflects a trade-off between soft and tough tissues. Two large clad gymnosperms with soft tissues and rhododendrons with tough tissues represented the trade-off at highlands, whereas the pattern was not obvious at mean and lowlands. Finally, trade-off in tree size represented by vessel area, hydraulic efficiency represented by conduit diameter, and light competitiveness represented by leaf area for genome area and specific plants then saved tree species distribution along Himalayan elevation of gradient. Along this extreme elevation of gradient, normally traits at higher integration levels, such as whole plant traits and branch traits, are more important for overall plant performance than the short leaf traits at lower integration levels, such as leaf traits. Thank you. That's all from my side. Now, if you have any comments and queries, you are more than welcome. Hi, my name is Carly Pomeroy, and today I'm going to talk to you about my research on whether or not latitudinal variation in light regime affects sapling architecture. I just recently graduated as an undergraduate researcher from UCLA, and I worked on this project with the help of the craft lab. So I'm going to start out with talking about how light regime varies with latitude. As you can see in this picture on the left, in the tropics, light is a, comes at a um, 90 degree angle. And in boreal forests on the right here, you can see that there's a lot more lateral light available in um, the understory, which greatly affects sapling growth habits. And um, so as such, there's a very high incident angle in the tropics and a low incident angle in boreal forests. Additionally, light is um, available more consistently year round at the equator and it's a lot more var variable across seasons at higher latitudes. And even within a single day, there's a lot more light availability in the tropics than in higher latitudes as well. And so taking a look at this observation made us curious about um, how this light availability can affect sapling architecture. So if light regimes are different, um, this must affect understory plants such as saplings heavily. And plant architecture changes according to light interception efficiency. So this led us to wonder how the light regime affects these understory plants. Um, as such with this question, we took a look at the Sunfleck model, um, which was published in 1985 by Terborg. And he kind of took a look at whether um, since there's a greater diversity of light habitats in tropics compared to boreal forests, and the fact that there's a higher range of incident angles in the understory there. So we considered the different types of saplings that there are. There's two um, main growth strategies. One is that plants choose to grow very, very tall and they don't invest much into crown um, building. And then another growth strategy is to invest a lot in building up a very big crown and to, um, it's called a pessimistic strategy because the plant doesn't uh, divert a lot of energy into growing nice and tall. So um, you can see that in the tropics, trees are broad and shallow and less 
shade tolerant as well. So um, the different light regimes that have selected for different plant, these different plant shapes. All right, this led us to predict that sapling architecture and allometry should change with latitude. Um, we hypothesized that plant architecture and allometry are related to light, which led us to this prediction. And um, we were interested in this because we wanted to dive into understanding forest regeneration dynamics, which is very important to better understand these tropical forests. All right, so to test this, we looked at 565 sampling species from 10 different sites globally. Um, we use plant architecture data from um, a database called the BAD, which is a biomass and allometry database. And the variables we looked at were crown depth, width, and sapling height. And we tested this by um, looking at variation in sapling architecture by latitude. Okay, so we found that there were latitudinal effects on sapling architecture. Um, crown relative thickness increases significantly with latitude and plants in higher latitudes rely on deeper crowns to intercept light at lower incidence angles. Um, we found a significant relationship for all three of these, these different ratios we took a look at with um, crown depth to height ratio. And we found that different sizes in different sites, so we had to use ratios as opposed to just using height values. And yeah, we found that there was a quadratic relationship in between all of these um, different latitude to, to um, width to depth ratios. All right, so with this research, we found that there is in fact a latitudinal sapling gradient and that there's a great diversity in light incidence angles available, which can explain large diversity of sapling growth strategies in the tropics because more light incidence angles means more light habitats which, and more complexity, which allows for more niches, which allows for more species because they need different growth strategies in order to fill these um, different niches. So. Hopefully moving forward, we'd like to take a look at environmental variables because they may affect light regimes inside forests such as topography or forest dynamics. And we're also hoping to find more mid-latitude sites as opposed to the data we already had with the bad database as well as our two new um, data sets. So I wanna thank the Craft Lab for all their support and um, my PI, Marcel Vaz, and um, my co-researcher, Jiha Rui. And I'd also like to thank everyone who contributed to the bad database, it was very helpful. Um, thanks for listening. Hello guys, my name is August Silva. I come to present the work in the ecological strategies in the cutting seasonal bright forest and woodland. Importance of understanding ecological strategies, understand community assembly across a spatial scale and the habitats. Ecological strategies are mechanisms that are the base of the geographic distribution of the species. Combinations of the functional traits generating different functional spectrums in plants, providing important acquisitive and conservative trade-offs. Favoring defense types of the ecological strategies which characterize species and communities in terms of their competitive ability, stress tolerance, and response and to disturbance. Our objective to identify ruby tree species ecological strategies in cutting seasonal dry tropical forest and woodland in region northeastern in Brazil. Cutting species are expected to be more concentrated in AC space due to make seasonal water deficits in the region. Study area comprise cutting domain local and seasonal dry tropical forest and woodland South America. Data obtained articles tests in the online databases. Uh, we use three traits uh, to start to identify. Um, traits uh, representing left economic spread. Classification of the strategies using strat file. We tested the relationship of the strategies complementary variables, uh, functional traits, taxonomy, uh, abundance, subregion, and vegetation types species and community liver analysis. 
ANOVAs were in logic transformations were used to compare the proportion of the strategies between groups. Species comprise a wide variety of the CSA strategies. Despite this, there was a tendency for species to be concentrated in competitive special space. Enough between taxonomic categories indicate a difference related to the component. After it, were the more competitors that rosids and magnolids. Wood density showed a significant relationship with the same strategies. Low density species showed to be more competitive than species with higher density wood. Evergreen species and uh, display increasing as strategies and ruderal species are mostly deciduous. Indicator species of abundance in subregions were significantly related to ruderal strategies. Abundance subregion number 10 had the lost proportion of the R strategies. At the community level, abundance subregion differed in the proportion of the of the three strategies. Subregion team are like linked to competitive space. Subregion number five for related of the stretches tolerant strategies. And subregions one seventy eight are apparently more related than ruder X. Indicator species of the vegetation types differed in the ruder species. Indicator species of the broad level forest differ from those uh, of open habitats and other strategies. Vegetation types at the community level differ between the three strategies. Broad level forest has the most competitive communities. Stiff level forest had the most stressful communities. Open habitats uh, had the most rural communities. Variation in the leaf economy spectrum can generate multiple strategies in the cutting. Species can exhibit different traits combination determining different strategies. At community level, specific strategies are linked to subregion and vegetation types. Conditions and resource gradients, in addition to historical factors, must generate multiple CSCA combinations. I'll take care of the collaboration. Multiple nutrient uptake strategies may coexist in similar tropical soils. We understand little about how plant strategies for nutrient acquisition vary at different spatial scales. Although these processes have implications for plant and ecosystem functioning and biogeochemical cycling. Currently, most of our understanding of fine roots, which are responsible for nutrient and water uptake, comes from temperate ecosystems. Although tropical ecosystems are climatically, edaphically, and biotically distinct and play key roles in global processes. Despite an abundance of highly weathered, nutrient poor soils and tropical forests, plant communities are often highly productive and phylogenetically diverse. These highly weathered soils frequently have low total phosphorus content and low available phosphate, which can directly be absorbed by plants. In addition to inorganic phosphorus, there are various organic phosphorus forms that require enzymatic hydrolysis before the phosphate can be absorbed, and they are progressively costly for plants to acquire. These include phosphate monoesters and inositol phosphates. These nutrients can also interact with the soil matrix and become less accessible to plants. In fact, the resource partitioning hypothesis posits that tropical plant coexistence is partially explained by differential investments into acquiring soil phosphorus fractions among species. In order to infer nutrient acquisition strategies, multiple types of fine root traits can be quantified and integrated. Although any possible combination of fine root trait values could occur, we propose that it is far more likely that certain values are coordinated and can be grouped into recurrent trait syndromes. In theory, there could be a single optimal resource acquisition strategy in a given environment, but evidence from tropical systems does not support this. Globally, morphological variation is greatest in the tropics where thick and thin rooted species coexist. Along gradients, fine root trait values often don't converge to optimal values in contrast to leaf and stem traits. In fact, 
Fine root trait variance was greater with insights than across a phosphorus gradient for a trait associated with organic phosphorus uptake, and variance was greatest in low phosphorus sites, suggesting that individual species in phosphorus-limited communities differentially utilize the simple organic phosphorus pool. At the smallest spatial scale, areas of heterospecific root overlap expressed greater phylogenetic and functional variation than expected by chance. Thus, based on evidence across spatial scales and tropical systems, we propose that multiple fine root trait syndromes may coexist. Furthermore, we propose this trait functional diversity could have implications for soil phosphorus partitioning. We created a conceptual framework for fine root trait syndromes, which emphasizes measuring multiple types of traits, for example morphological and physiological, for a single species while explicitly considering growth constraints and soil characteristics. We hypothesize five potentially coexisting syndromes based on fundamental trait trade-offs and synergies, in addition to reports of significant interspecific variation in tropical tree species adapted to phosphorus poor soils. Arrow direction represents the relative trait magnitudes among species in a community, and red and blue shading indicate high and low magnitudes respectively. Syndromes are primarily distinguished by symbiotic association type, root morphology, their interactions, and the implications for root functions. A and thick are thick rooted arboscular mycorrhizal species with long fine root longevities that rely on symbionts to absorb inorganic phosphorus. A M thin are thin rooted arboscular mycorrhizal species with short longevities that are more self sufficient and physiologically active and efficiently acquire simple organic phosphorus. E C M thin are thin rooted ectomycorrhizal species with lower longevities that particularly access simple organic phosphorus. ECM thick are thick rooted ectomycorrhizal species with greater longevities that access complex organic phosphorus, specifically inositol phosphate or phytate, due to greater ectomycorrhizal colonization and enzyme production by symbionts. NM thin are non mycorrhizal cluster root forming species with very short longevities that are entirely self sufficient and access organic phosphorus in small pockets of soil via high localized physiological activity. Our framework presents testable hypotheses and guidelines for syndrome research, which can verify syndrome coexistence and partition variance to evaluate its importance for overall trait variation. We conclude that fine root functional diversity of coexisting species may be underappreciated, especially in the tropics, and have implications for scales of fine root trait variation, ecosystem functioning, and biogeochemical cycling. Thank you for listening. Today, I'll be talking about some preliminary results for a project that we have trying to understand how the uplift of mountains shaped by diversity. And particularly in the neotropics, the uplift of the Andes has had an enormous consequence for how climate is distributed, how environmental uh, conditions are distributed across the continent, but also for how biodiversity is distributed. And the Andes typically is host to some of the highest uh, biodiversity regions in the whole planet for plants and animals. How, however, the uplift of mountains and more generally the emergence of novel environmental conditions in a region can shape lineage diversification and the distribution of species and diversity in multiple ways. On the one hand, uh, the emergence of novel environmental conditions can create opportunities for clades of species that are pre-adapted to these environments to colonize and uh, sort in an ecological fashion uh, across these different environmental conditions. In this scenario, uh, the species that you find in different environments belong to clades that are older than the environmental gradient and the adaptations necessary to survive these conditions also evolved for the most part before the emergence of the environmental gradient. On the other hand, um, the uh, new environmental conditions can create opportunities for recent adaptive diversification, where clades that were already present in the region or that arrive after the uplift of mountains or their generation of the new environmental conditions uh, have a chance to evolve new adaptations um, to colonize and survive in these different environments. So we're trying to understand to what degree the uplift of the Andes, particularly of the central Andes that happened during the last 30 million years 
shape the evolution of place and the distribution of diversity across uh, elevational gradients. And to do this, we're using data from the Madidi project, which has a large network of forest plots that go from the lowland Amazonian forests all the way to the tree line. Using this data, we can characterize the elevational distributions of the species. For example, by connecting the lowest and highest point of uh, distribution for a species, we can create an elevational range. But for our analysis, we're particularly interested on the elevational position, which we characterize using the mean elevation. High values of mean elevation suggest that the species uh, has a distribution concentrated in the highlands, low values of the species is mainly in the lowlands. Additionally, for each species, we have measured a number of different functional traits, which can potentially represent some of the adaptations necessary to survive in these different environmental conditions. And we used uh, principal component analysis to summarize that, vari that variation in functional traits into new dimensions uh, of functional trait variation that accounts for correlations between these different uh, traits. So first question that we had was to what degree the elevational position of a species is accounted for by these functional traits or these potential adaptations. And we find that about 40% of the variation in elevation is explained by functional traits. For example, we found that the species in the lowlands uh, typically reflect the species that have high specific leaf area, while species in the highlands typically are species with thick leaves that have uh, high dry matter content and also uh, thick barks. We were also particularly interested in the phylogenetic structure or the phylogenetic signal, both in the elevational positions of the species, but also in these potential adaptations. So this figure shows a disparity through time plot for mean elevation, for the elevational position. High values of um, disparity suggest that uh, species uh, or clades at a specific age have a lot of the variation uh, of uh, seen in these traits. So for example, clades would have a lot of variation in the elevational position. While low values of disparity reflect uh, variation that mainly happens from one clade to another. So one individual clade typically has uh, little of the variation in mean elevation. To make sense of these empirical patterns, we compare it to a null model. In this case, a Brownian model of evolution that is bounded so that the species can evolve their uh, elevational positions, but they cannot have elevational positions below sea level or above the tree line. And when we do this, we see that a lot of the clades uh, that predate the uplift of the Andes marked by this line here, um, show less variation within clades that you would expect given this null model, suggesting that uh, clades have constrained elevational distributions. However, when we contrast this with what we see for uh, trait dimensions, here represented by the trait dimension one, it's very, it's very uh, different. Uh, for trait dimensions, we see that most of the variation happens um, within clades, and that, that is consistent across uh, the, the, the evolution of the clade, suggesting the opposite pattern. So we find that in terms of elevation, um, the phylogenetic patterns suggest that potentially clades um, have constrained evolutions and potentially reflect uh, the colonization of pre-adapted clades to occupy different elevations. But when we look at functional traits, uh, the results are, are the opposite. And they suggest more that a lot of the diversification that led to these different functional traits happened after the uplift of the Andes and potentially uh, of course uh, um, within clades. So each clade has a lot of the variation in functional traits. Uh, and we're currently working on the new analysis and uh, further work that will help us clarify these potentially contrasting results. If the only information you had about a tropical ecosystem was that it was seasonally dry, you'd probably guess that the dominant leaf phenology is deciduous, that is, plants are without leaves for a considerable portion of the year. And you'd be right. 
especially if you're talking about large spatial scales. But at smaller scales, like you see in these images of an Indian savanna, characterizing these trees as deciduous can mask a lot of variation in their leaf and phenology. In this research, we ask, how can we reliably predict this variation? Hi everyone, my name is Shashank Kongol. In the next few minutes, I'll attempt to convince you that the answer to that question is by using functional traits related to resource acquisition, provided some key conditions are satisfied. But first, I want to specifically thank our local consultants, Pedana and Virana, who are exceptional naturalists from the Chinchu tribe. The savanna where we did this research has been their home for hundreds of years. Leaves, being the primary organs for carbon capture, operate under a strict constraint that the leaf carbon gain over its lifetime is greater than or equal to the carbon invested. Therefore, functional traits related to resource acquisition are likely to help us predict the phenological strategy. For example, in water stress environments, species with high leaf trimatter and carbon content, which are reflective of higher structural investment, enable them to withstand lower leaf water potentials. Similarly, higher wood density reduces the risk of hydraulic failure. Both these properties would enable species to delay leaf senescence and retain leaves longer, thus enabling them to recoup the leaf carbon invested. To test this, we monitored leafing phenology twice a month for 113 individuals across the 11 most abundant tree species in a one hectare patch in a mesic savanna in South India. We examined the timing of different phenology stages, leaf flush, the first sign of mature leaves in the canopy, when most leaves in the canopy were mature, the start of senescence and the minimum levels of canopy, which you can see in the legend. The species abbreviations are on the y-axis. On the x-axis are the months. The diagram shows the remarkable variation in phenology both within and across species, especially in the middle of the growing season, right here. But low variation in the ends of the phenological cycle shows that species are constrained by the length of the growing season in this dry environment. We also estimated the duration it takes to go from one stage to the other among all these five stages. We then collected species level functional traits, that is specific leaf area, leaf nitrogen content, leaf carbon content, leaf dry matter content, and wood density. We then performed a regression analysis between these traits and phenology variables. In this diagram, adjacent arrows indicate high positive correlation, opposite arrows indicate high negative correlation. We found that phenology variables shown next to the tick marks, that is the first sign of mature leaves, when most leaves of the canopy were mature and duration between these two stages and the duration of leaf deployment were consistently predicted by leaf functional traits. As expected, high carbon investment in leaves was related to longer leaf deployment, but earlier leaf maturation, potentially allowing the species to recoup their carbon investment. But why were the phenology variables marked in cross, not predicted by species functional traits? Interestingly, but perhaps not surprisingly, these variables showed greater intraspecific variation than interspecific variation. So species functional traits were not useful in predicting them. We conclude that species functional traits related to carbon in investment in leaves can therefore predict phenology in this system, provided the phenology variables show greater interspecific variation than intraspecific variation. This also suggests that a tropical deciduous tree functional type in dynamic global vegetation models may not adequately capture these diverse strategies. I want to finally thank these institutions and individuals for support ATBC for the opportunity and you for listening. Hello, everybody. My name is Leonardo Maracaibes dos Santos. I am research at the Instituto de Pesquisa Ambiental da Amazônia. I will present the results of our working response of functional traits of preserve and fragmented riparia forests in the surf Amazon.
Deforestation of tropical rainforests can have a broader impacts affecting global climate and biodiversity. What in the long term contribute us for forest degradation and change in the forest and faunus composition? The consequence of this process include at the lowers, fragmentation at the fate and fire. In the Mato Grosso state, only of rise heights of deforestation has occurred in the up Shingu region. The pine forest in our the main forest type remain in the landscape. Assess the weather fictional trait of three species in barrier forests in agricultural landscape differing from those in tucker barrier forests in the southern Amazon. Considering that the forestation promotes change in the structure and the species diversity of fragmented barrier forests, we will test here three hypotheses about community exclusive species and common species. To test these hypotheses, we will conduct some forest inventory and something to have functional traits of these species occurring in 10 different sites. Here are the 12 something functional trait. We did analysis at the level of plant community, exclusive species, and common species at all levels. We use MANOVA. Our results show functional traits with active characteristics in barrier forests in intact forests and conservative ones in barrier forests in agricultural landscape indicating that deforestation and add effect change forest functional. This graph shows that comparison of plant trade at community level, green square shows trade that are great in Taka forests and orange squares the trait that are great in landscape agricultural forests. This graph compares just the exclusive species and only SLA are significantly different shows high value for intact forests. Common species with green square the friends significantly and were great in intact forest and ours were great in landscape agricultural forests. The difference we found reflecting acquisitive strategy in intact forest and conservative strategy in forests in agricultural landscape. Deforestation and subsequent land use transition strongly influence the trajectory of Amazonia riparian forests because it changed the composition of three species, it reduced the diversity of the three species. Finally, it altered the functional trait of three species. Thank you very much. Ciao, my fellow flora and fauna. My name is Mimi. I am a master's student in Dr. Kevin Simonin's environmental plant physiology lab here at San Francisco State University. I'm here today to talk to you about my project, 
tracking leaf trait differentiation of the newly diverging subspecies Kinopodium oahuensis on the Hawaiian Islands. Um, some things that you should know about Kinopodium oahuensis before we get started is that Kinopodium oahuensis is the only Kinopodium species to be found on the Hawaiian Islands. This means that the diverging leaf trait characteristics that we're going to be talking about today are due almost entirely to environmental pressures and not due to cross hybridization between other Kinopodium species. Now, we sampled six sites across the different islands. Um, let's look at the map to get a closer look about what those sites look like. Here are the sites that we are sampling. All of these areas are where the plants receive direct sunlight exposure. Oahu, Molokai, and Maui are all coastal and subject to ocean seawater spray. However, Molokai is not found on the beach. Molokai population is found on sea cliffs. Um, the last site is on the big island and is subalpine in habit. So it lives above the cloud line. They sometimes get snowed on even. Yeah, it snows in Hawaii. Here we have two images of two different populations on the island of Molokai, both at four weeks worth of growth. On the left hand side, we have our Elio Point population with exhibits a prostrate growth habit. So creepy crawly grows close to the ground. It has thick succulent leaves. On the right hand side, we have our Puka Pele site. They grow erect, so straight up and down, and you can see that the leaves are noticeably bigger. Um, these differences in leaf morphology have led us to believe that there's also difference in these different populations hydraulic programming. So we're going to be doing stomatal conductance measurements, stomatal size measurements, stomatal density, leaf mass per unit area, and my favorite, trigger loss point and osmotic potential. Let's talk more about those ones. So we measure trigger loss point and osmotic potential by doing pressure volume curves. These pressure volume curves allow us to measure at what level of water stress each of these populations can really handle. Now I'm gonna show you a video about how this works a little bit. And basically what we do is we put a lot of pressure on this leaf until the water shoots up the reverse side of the xylem. And the xylem cells are these white bundles that you see here that form kind of this crescent moon shape. Oh, there it went. Did you see it bubble just a little bit? And now it's bubbling just a lot. So we do this measurement over and over again, once when they're in juvenile stage and once when they're at an adult stage to re really figure out okay, how much stress can the leaves handle? How much stress can the plant handle? How much stress can the whole population handle in an ideal water environment? As global climate continues to shift, average rainfall temperatures and other abiotic conditions, we will see more speciation events like this one. Kinopodium oahuensis is adapting to new climates and new environments. But with rising sea levels, some of these coastal sites are in danger of degradation or disappearing completely. My research will influence the understanding of what levels of water stress that each of these kinopodium sites can handle, increase our understanding about how the native Hawaiian kinopodium species are responding to variations in climate, which will provide baseline information for conservation efforts, such as which populations should be prioritized given our current climate projections. We will be donating seeds that we collect at the end of the experiment to restoration organizations in Hawaii, which will directly impact other species that depend on Kinopodium oahuensis. Thank you so much for coming and listening to my talk. My plants and I thank you so much. Hello everyone, my name is Stephanie Fogliardi from the University of Toronto Scarborough in Canada. And on behalf of my co-authors, I'm presenting our talk titled Root Functional Traits and Microbial Variations Across a Gradient of Foliar Disease Incidence in Agroforestry Systems. Agroforestry, which is the integration of shade trees with crops, is a common agricultural practice in tropical environments. With their enhanced plant biodiversity, they also have enhanced functional diversity that promote ecosystem processes. 
our understanding of microbial communities associated with plants is expanding to include internationally significant cash crops, including tropical perennial species like cacao, banana, and coffee, which are often grown in biodiverse agroforestry systems under a variety of agricultural management practices, which then impact biotic interactions both above and below ground. We know that plants associated microbial communities vary based on the genotype of the host plant and environmental conditions such as climate and soil conditions. The environment also largely explains root trait expression where there is significant variation in many crops and this variation is often associated with variations in microbial communities. Specific to agroforestry systems, Microbial communities also depend on the type of agricultural management regime in place, such as specific amendments and the presence of shade trees. There's also evidence that microbial communities may change with plant disease incidence, though results in the literature vary with different crops and different phytopathogens. The goal of our present study is to compare the plant associated microbial communities across both a gradient of foliar disease incidence and across different agroforestry management regimes within a single plant genotype. Using one variety of Cafe Arabica as a model species, we characterize specifically the coffee root fungal endophyte populations across a gradient of coffee leaf rust or CLR which is a prominent fungal disease in coffee systems around the world that can be detrimental in coffee producing regions. We use visible chlorotic spots on the underside of coffee leaves, pictured on the far left, to estimate plant level CLR incidence, and we sampled from coffee plants with low through to high CLR incidence. We sampled from three distinct agroforestry management regimes including inorganic and organic amendments with single shade tree species and organic with the addition of regionally sourced microbial inoculants applied to the soil, as well as greater shade tree species diversity. Across all plots, we found over a thousand unique fungal operational taxonomic units in coffee roots with 214 unique fungal genera identified Similar to previous studies, there were key genera that were identified across all samples, including Acrocolima, Cetophoma, Mycena, Pyrenocatopsis, and Matsushima myces, which were the most abundant genera in our samples. These results reveal some overlap with previous studies on coffee root associated microbes that also attempted to describe a core microbial community for coffee below ground. Our results did not reveal differences in fungal community composition or diversity according to foliar disease incidence. However, we did find that community composition varied significantly across the three agroforestry management regimes, highlighting how these communities respond more to the contrasting soil conditions created by selected management practices including the addition of specific amendments and the biodiversity of the agroforestry system. We also found that fungal community composition varied significantly with key coffee root traits, including fine root length density and specific root length. This suggests either a direct effect of fungi on coffee root traits or a co-variation of both fungi and root traits to similar soil conditions created by the agroforestry management regime. While our results highlight the key role that agroforestry management plays in shaping plant associated microbial communities, it leads to the generation of new questions of what this means for pathogens and plant disease in diverse agroecosystems. Thank you for listening in on our talk today, and I look forward to responding to any questions you may have. Hi everyone, my name is Juliane Stop, and I will present today the work I'm doing with colleagues from the Natural Science Museum here in Madrid, and also colleagues from Unicamp in Campinas. 
So the main objective of the work we are doing is to understand how changes in species classification impact ecological findings and also trying to understand uh, which taxa can have a higher taxonomic uncertainty. So as a first step towards this objective, we ask the question, are taxa equally likely to undergo reclassification? Well, if that's the case, then we expect that the uncertainty will be randomly distributed all over the tree of life. But if it's not the case, then this uncertainty will be higher and also clustered in some branches of the tree. So then to answer this question, we hypothesize that recent and closely related lineages are subject to a higher taxonomic uncertainty. Why that? Because these taxa they may share a more subtle taxonomic uh, morphological variation, and therefore the taxon that have affected the way they are classified and also described described over the years. So to test this hypothesis, we compile a list of Amazonian plants, a list of names of Amazonian plants from three sources. That's Cardoso, Teixeira, and Flora do Brasil. We also compiled that associated synonyms of all these names. And whenever possible, we got the age of the taxa from dated phylogenies. So I will show you now some results that we have for the palms, only one family. So we found, what we see actually is that a lot of descriptions and reclassification happened over the past 300 years. If we go back here to the 1830, we had there 22 names of the, of the accepted names that we have now that were associated with 47 synonyms. If we jump to what we have today, we have 224 accepted names that are associated with 1,463 names. Actually, what we see is that we have been accumulating not only accepted names, but also the number of synonyms have accumulated quite a lot. And a lot of the names that we are describing today, they, become, they still become synonyms. So where, we ask where did the synonyms, all the synonyms go? And actually, what we find is that they are mostly here. So in this graph, we have here in the x-axis the million of years, that's the age, and the number of synonyms for each species. And you see the early lineages, they, share, they have a whole range of the number of synonyms. And you see that the clade, the age of the taxa, can predict the maximum number of synonyms of a taxa. So if you visualize this result, in a phylogenetic tree, what do we see here? So we plotted here the percentage of synonyms of all names in the genus. So if you look here, for instance, in the back trees, in Atalea, we see that more than 60% of all names that were ever given to species within that genus were actually synonyms. And some other species, these ones, they have a much, much lower number of synonyms. So if then we go to the conclusion and we see that taxa are indeed at different odds of being reclassified and the more recent ones have a, more, have a higher chance to undergo reclassification. The uncertainty is not randomly distributed. I say all the taxonomic rearrangement that we had so far were more likely to happen in, young, in younger lineages. Well, these findings has implications for how we understand richness, dominance, and the amazement, many aspects of ecology. With that, I thank you very much. Please get in touch if you have questions and really hope to see you soon. <laughs>
Well, thank you to all panelists for these great uh, presentations. Uh, we now open the session of uh, question and answers. Um, so we have a first question from uh, uh, Sean Pang uh, uh, for Surya. So uh, he says, Namaste. Thank you for your presentation. Love the forest of Nepal. Considering the sensitivity of the mountain region, regions to climate change, how might your result affect or inform conservation decision aimed at mitigating the effect of climate change? Shall I answer it, Juan? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, namaste, Juan, and thank you, Juan, for yeah, moderating this session. Uh, Sun, you were you are absolutely right. I mean, the mountain ecosystems are really sensitive to climate change. And that's our next question, actually. In this chapter, what we try to de uh, do is what makes where the plants are at the moment. And in next chapter, what we are trying to do is if these traits can really act as proxies to predict how these species are going to respond to the climate change. And what we did in the next follow-up study is we selected one of the important traits in terms of defining this distribution. So in our case, we selected conduit diameter and tested if we can really use conduit diameter as a proxy to predict species response to climate change. And what we found uh, at, uh, at present is, so the species which have actually larger conduit, I mean wider conduit, they are the ones which are going to get benefited from uh, warmer and wetter conditions which are predicted for Himalayas. And at the moment also, what you can see is like most of the lowland species, they have these white conduits and these white conduits allow them to acquire more water to compensate for the higher photosynthesis rate so that they can put on higher growth. And for that reason, I mean, as these uh, wider conduits allow them to be more acquisitive and put on rapid growth, we, uh, we hypothesize that these uh, species with wider trade will be the ones which will be shifting faster and showing larger changes in distribution area. But in contrary to that, we found these are the ones which will be going to maintain their current distribution and also will have some opportunity to extend their distribution at the upper limits. So maybe in future, these trees with the wider conduits will be the ones which will be a, showing some expansion in terms of distribution area in Himalayas. So thank you. That's all from me for now. And if you have more questions, we can yeah, do that later. Thank you, Surya. Very interesting. Uh, we now have two questions from uh, for Carly, but I think Carly is not uh, online. So I invite uh, Sean Pang and uh, Camille Girard to post the questions, uh, ask the question directly to um, to Carly. Or, uh, but I will still post those sessions in the uh, as so ask them in WeWork, but I will still post them um, on, on our session. So hopefully they can be answered later on. So, um, um, so we have, and we have one from Adriana also, bravo, sorry, um, for Carly. So, so those will be all posted online. Um, so there's a question uh, then from uh, Sean, Thank for Mimi. Uh, great introduction. Uh, is there, I agree, a very nice introduction. Is there environmental data to support or pot potentially explain the drivers of this differentiation? It would be an interesting next step to find out why. So Mimi. Hi, I'm in the greenhouse, so it's a little bit noisy, um, but there is world climate data that we're trying to analyze in R to like partition out different little like environmental niches of all my different little populations. Um, so yes, there is. Uh, we're not really sure if world clim is like finite enough to define these like habitats because Hawaii is like pretty small. It's not like different habitats in the Amazon, which is like huge. Um, but there is data out there and I'm trying to incorporate that into my project. Hopefully that answered your question. Thank you, Mimi. 
so we have a, another question from uh, Shen Peng uh, for Juliana. Uh, awesome data and analysis, considering the variability in the classification of species, what kind of biodiversity units should we use to inform conservation prioritization? Correct me if I'm wrong, but absolute species riches does not seem to be the best option in, life, in light of your findings. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the interest in the work. So actually what we try to, ideally, we, we should, what we, we are trying to do is to get, a, to get a measure of taxonomic uncertainty and include this uncertainty when you're estimating species richness. So it's, the uncertainty is unavoidable and it exists. And I think we also, I see the, a lot of work with, like, especially in this section of functional traits. I, to me, it's like going, taking only functional traits will miss a lot of the picture of the biodiversity. So I would not say, okay, so we don't take like species identity, but we just go to the traits. No, I think ideally we want to incorporate a measure of taxonomic uncertainty in all these works. That's my, my view on that. Did you answer? Thank you, Juliana. Uh, now we have a question from Flavia Sa uh, for Juliana. Do you think that your findings can also be observed in other taxonomic groups like animals? So I, I, I think yes. Because we try the same analysis for much more, much larger number of genera of plants in the Amazon, and we see exactly the same pattern. So now I, I actually I would be very curious to see how if it holds to other other groups. I, I was talking to people who worked with birds, some ornithologists, and I we think it it would hold, but we didn't test yet. Thank you, Juliana. So we have now a question from uh, Mary Lee Verdugo Latkin. Um, I'm not sure who's this question directly to, directed to. Um, so I will try to figure it out, but I will move to the next question. Uh, the next question is uh, from uh, um, Guillermo Bañares for Sebastián Tello. Uh, your results seem to seem to indicate a huge functional trait plasticity within clades. Will not functional strategy be expected constrained to particular lineages? Um, yeah. So what the what the results seem to suggest is that uh, for traits, there's a lot of variation within clades. Uh, uh, clays that sort of uh, predate the uplift of the central Andes that predate 30 million years. Uh, the origin of that could be potentially plasticity within species, uh, but it could also be adaptations, even, even of populations of the same species to different elevations, but also of the same of different species to different environmental conditions. We just got started with this project, so there's a number of things that we would like to do, uh, but we would like to sort of partition that that variation more finely and to identify what clades are doing what more specifically. But certainly plasticity could be could be playing a role. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, Mary Lee, please, if you, I, I couldn't figure out who your question is directed to. So if you could write it in the question and answer se uh, section, I will, I will uh, ask the question. So the next question is from William Farfan Rios. Sebastian, great, great talk. Thanks. Do you have an estimate of the proportion of the modern day taxa, of what proportion of the modern day taxa were pre-adapted to the novel environment? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a little difficult to know. And um, sort of the analysis that we have done so far, kind of kept, sort of, for example, for the disparity through time uh, 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 analysis that I showed, essentially shows the average variation in a clade defined at a specific time uh, during the evolution of the, of the clades. Um, and so it represents an average, but something we would like to do is actually look at specific clades and see whether the disparity or the variation within a clade is uh, greater or is less than you would expect uh, given a specific null hypothesis. And so that will potentially help us identify specific clades that seem to be potentially pre-adapted and that's the way they colonize the Andes 
versus clays that potentially diversified a lot of the variation in functional traits and, and elevation of position after the uplift. But uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question, uh, but I, I still don't have an answer yet. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, so Mary Lee uh, wrote us that the question is for all panelists, uh, but given our time constraint, I maybe ask for maybe one or two of you to, to answer. So the question is, uh, thank you for all your presentations. Uh, is possible for strate strategies function of uh, functional strategies in plant have other options different than conservative and acquisitive extremes? We have a gradient and many combination in functional traits in future in, and in future research, it will be important to include at least one trait for root, leaves, wood and reproductive traits. So if anyone wants to ask, answer, ask, ask, answer the question on the, this conservative and acquisite extremes. If not, I can, we can always post it for later, but Caroline. Oh. Yeah, I can speak a little to this. Um, I focus mostly on roots. So I, I think that there are definitely syndromes that exist that are not entirely acquisitive or conservative. And something that's really interesting about roots is that the plant itself can grow a really conservative root, but it can form symbiotic associations that make it much more acquisitive. So it's actually really complex I feel uh, classifying a species as acquisitive or conservative. And then to complicate that further, you can have uh, an acquisitive root system, but then a more conservative leaf and stem um, traits. So I, I think there, there's some new research that's working on integrating all of the traits of the different organs with implants and seeing how those, um, how those economic trade-offs align across organs. Um, but I think that's a really great avenue for future research to look at those relationships across within plants, across different tissues and plants. Thank you, Karin. That was a really interesting answer. Uh, um, what? If we yes, have Surya, please go. Yeah, I would like to quickly add something if we have some time. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. And thank you, thank you for the questions. And I completely agree with you because uh, I mean, like there, there, we can have so many combinations of trait and that's one of the things we I'm also trying so in my research because uh, earlier research were mainly focusing on certain organs of a plant, but now the researches are becoming more and more complex and they are trying to integrate more traits in into one research, so not just focusing on leaves or not just focusing on uh, roots, but try to combine all these and try to come up with the uh, new possibilities to give new meanings to these trait combinations. Uh, but in my case, maybe because I focus more on the uh, trees uh, where we lose uh, some things with the, because as I am talking about the bigger statured plants, so I lost this, uh, axis maybe where we talk about these differences in the sides so, and in my case it became like more the traits related to leaf which is more related to conservative and executive strategy became more obvious than the sides so sometimes the size can be the difference in the size can be the strategy to cope up with the environmental gradients so there are lots of possibilities I think thank you thanks Surya it's a very nice uh, topic. We can also post it on the on, on WUVA if some of you want to continue. So uh, moving on, we have um, another question from uh, Guillermo uh, Bañares for Sebastian. Sebastian is ready. Um, is your results seem to indicate a huge functional trait plasticity within clades? Um, well, did I read that? No. Uh, will not functional strategy be expected to be constrained to particular lineages? I think I did read that, but please confirm. Um, I, I guess so. Yeah, I think it was repeated, but I guess I didn't answer. Oh, yeah, it's the repeated. Part of the question, maybe. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, it is. But yeah, yeah, you, you would expect a lot of uh, functional, functional signal in the functional traits. And to be honest, uh, sort of when we run this preliminary analysis, we were kind of surprised that the functional traits show the pattern it showed. 
um, and we, we would like to keep exploring to try to understand why why that happens. Um, but the, there is definitely some phylogenetic signals. So there is uh, sort of specific lineages that have specific traits, uh, but a lot of that seems to be quite recent. So post date the uplift of the central Andes, at least that happened during the last thirty million years. And we have another question. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, we have another question uh, for you from Adriana Bravo. Great talk. Do you notice any difference in the in the patterns shown by different traits? So the way we've done the analysis so far is by using the principal components as the as the variables sort of that integrate multiple traits. We haven't done this analysis trait by trait yet, uh, but I suspect the results will be very similar. But in general, for, for uh, most of the dimensions of functional uh, variation, the results are kind of consistent and suggesting that sort of a lot of the variation uh, is uh, sort of maybe originated after the uplift of the central Andes. Oh, Juan, you need to yes. Yes, thank you. Sometimes it works with the pressure bar, but sometimes it does. Um, so we, we need to wrap up now uh, because we have another session starting in a few minutes. So thank you again to all panelists and attendees. This was a really interesting session. And uh, I look forward to continuing some of this discussion through Uber. So I hope you all have a great day, great evening. Maybe for some of you it's very late and uh, so. It's great seeing you, seeing you all.